at us. Um, today, it's really a true pleasure to be able to introduce our board lecturer for this year, which is Martin Head Gordon from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, we made the invitation to Martin, I believe, about 30 months ago. So I think this is about as long in the making as any seminar that I can imagine it was supposed to be uh, um, seminar um, a year ago. But needless to say, that wasn't meant to be. Uh, Martin is originally from Australia, received his bachelor's and master's degree from Monash University in Melbourne, and then moved um, to Pittsburgh to Carnegie Mellon, where he completed his PhD with John Copeland, the name that should be familiar to many of you. And then a postdoc at, at, the, at Bell Labs, where John Tully was at the time, and um, moved to the University of California at Berkeley in 1992, where he's risen through the ranks and received a number of awards um, early on, including the Sloan Fellowship and Packard Fellowship, and more recently um, has been elected to the Royal as a fellow of the Royal Society and um, the National Academy of Sciences, among other and many other um, accolades. It's really a true pleasure to have Martin here. I got to know Martin particularly through our time together on the FIS Division Executive Committee, which I think is, <laughs> is a job that we were glad to have done and glad to have in the past at this stage. And so I would I hope that you all join me in welcoming Martin. I will also mention that after this, we will have a reception back in 102 CHB. So thank you, Martin, for coming, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, microphone. <laughs> well, it's a, a pleasure to be here, um, and um, and <laughs> and. A pleasure to follow Sharon Hammer Schiffer, um, who is actually my intellectual sister. We were both postdocs with John Tully. Um, and uh, a pleasure to tell you something about some of the work that um, has been going on in my group on modeling heterogeneous electrocatalysis. And I'll focus today in particular on the CO2 reduction reaction and, um, and try and show you a little bit of what theory can tell us and maybe tell you a little bit about what theory can't tell us um, in 2022. Um, before we do that, I should probably tell you a bit about why we are talking about this problem. And um, the advance of civilization is really driven by energy consumption. We enjoy a high standard of living as a result of high energy consumption. And if we look at the great disparities in energy consumption per capita between different countries, we can anticipate that world energy demand is going to increase rapidly in the future. There is no question about that. The only question is, what will the source of, the, of that energy be? And um, people surely in developing countries and uh, um, have the right to aspire to a standard of living comparable to our own. And today, energy use is dominated by fossil fuels. We see in the Ukraine crisis the important role of natural gas as an energy source for Europe. And, uh, and so essentially the, the challenge for Europe and for the world is to replace these um, fossil fuels by renewables, solar, which whose um, you know, production of which is only gradually increasing at the moment. And, um, Besides, um, besides energy independence, um, there is the whole question of climate change. And um, what you're looking at here is, um, is essentially the march of, uh, of global temperature, the, the global average temperature, showing that in 2020, we are about 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than we were um, and it's around the, uh, the, the turn of the industrial age, or even compared to the middle of the 20th century. And, um, and that is sufficiently alarming and has sufficient knock-on effects, both, to, um, both in terms of rising sea levels and climate change impact, that, um, that this is a, a, a topic of really world focus. And so the COP26 agreement, 
recognizes that the impacts of climate change would be much lower at a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared with two degrees and and this uh, and this agreement resolved to pursue efforts to limit temperature increase to that. Look how close we are to 1.5 degrees already today. So, um, um, so then looking ahead, what are the drivers of climate change? The drivers um, are greenhouse gases um, by overwhelming scientific consensus. And that's mirrored by the fact that those increases in global average temperature um, coincide with um, increases in atmospheric CO2 content without any change in solar flux. So um, global CO2, atmospheric CO2 content in turn is driven by anthropogenic CO2 emissions, uh, which are shown here. And if you take a look at this, you can see that over the period from 1960 to the present day, we have seen virtual, we have seen essentially a tripling of, uh, of human caused CO2 emissions. There are little hops and bumps in corresponding to geopolitics, the collapse of the Soviet Union, various oil crises, the global financial crises, those give little dips and hiccups, but the overall trend reflects what I showed you on the first slide, that improving standards of living are driven by higher energy consumptions. COVID-19 is the latest hiccup. But looking at the COP26 agreement then, reducing global CO2 emissions to try and impact climate change, to try and keep future temperature increases to 1.5 degrees or below, would require 45% reduction in human sourced CO2 emissions by 2030 relative to the 2010 level, and then to net zero around mid-century. So we're all scientists, we can look at the extrapolation, and then we can see the agreement, which is to do this, and then that. It looks very difficult, but that's really why research into renewable energy is so important and why building the scientific base for a renewable based um, energy economy is so important. So how could CO2 emissions be captured and reutilized? Um, there are, there's much information here. The one that I've pulled from is a Secretary of Energy Advisory Board report, just showing you a, really a landscape, a wealth of possibilities, direct capture, um, CO2 storage, and then conversion. And the uh, essentially the theme of my talk is the science that links CO2 capture to subsequent chemical conversion, which could ultimately lead to closed loop cycles or a whole wealth of other possibilities. So, um, so let's then begin thinking about why this is so difficult. Essentially, we're trying to run combustion backwards. So in other words, we begin at the very, very bottom, the very bottom of a deep thermodynamic well, and we want to kind of lift ourselves out of it with energy, well, with solar energy, um, or at least energy that derives from solar photons. We need to do enough electrical work, green with green electricity, to make delta G negative, to convert CO2 into, for argument's sake, biobutanol. Um, and, um, and we then need to use a catalyst of some kind to stabilize the reactive intermediates and, um, and of course, to make the kinetics possible. So altogether, this is a, a very difficult challenge. Um, it, we're trying to do non-spontaneous chemistry. And, uh, and to then look at it, um, this is a, a cartoon of the um, energy land, the free energy landscape associated with the six electron reduction of CO to methane, which is the eight electron reduction, the end of the eight electron reduction of CO2 to methane. Basically the red descending staircase is what happens when you do electrochemistry with about one volt of bias. From a thermodynamic point of view, all of the relevant intermediates, surface bound CHO, surface bound CHOH, surface bound CH, CH2, CH3, and finally methane, they're all thermodynamically downhill as we do the one volt of electrical work associated with each electron transfer. And of course, uh, that's the idea then. This is on a copper surface 
And as you'll be seeing in a few moments, copper is an especially significant metal, at least at this stage of our understanding of the CO2 reduction reaction. Why is copper so significant? This table summarizes classic experimental data from Hori's group um, showing you why. The columns here are organized by the product made by um, electrode catalysis of, of, um, of CO2 uh, and protons over copper as the cathode. And you, if you look at the methane column, you see that copper is by far the best, 33% Faradaic efficiency going to methane. Almost no other metal will do it. If you look at ethene, copper is the only one that does anything significant. If you look at ethanol, copper is the only metal that does anything significant. Propanol, similarly. So um, many metals will reduce CO2 to CO, and you can do chemistry with CO if you combine it with hydrogen, Fischer-Tropsch type chemistry. But if you want to make hydrocarbons, copper is the simplest material that can actually do it and virtually the only simple material that can do it. So hence, we will want to study in some detail why copper can do this. And um, finally, the last two columns are also important. Um, the second last column is formate. So in other words, the conjugate base of formic acid and hydrogen. It's quite easy to reduce protons to hydrogen. That'll happen on almost every metal. And it's fairly easy to reduce CO2 to formate. That will happen on many surfaces, but we don't really want formic acid. There's not a good formic acid fuel cell, for instance. So copper is important and, um, and selectivity is critical. So um, we want to basically make sure that the first transfer of a proton and an electron favors star COOH over star OCHO over star H because the bottom channel leads to hydrogen, the middle channel leads to formic acid. Um, what else is known about copper experimentally? Well, it's known that the um, reduction products are quite facet sensitive. So in other words, it matters whether you use the 111 most close packed surface or the slightly more open 100 surface. Copper 100 favors ethene production over methane. Copper 111 favors methane production over ethene production. So we will be studying copper 100, but we'll also be interested in why is it better than copper 111. Um, so, um, so that's good information. Um, I showed you experimental data before about the final products, but what about byproducts? There are lots of byproducts. Um, so here are some of them. There are four known C1 products and six known C2 products. And the six C2s include things like glyoxal, acid aldehyde, um, a bunch of other things, in addition to the main products, the main C2 products of ethanol and ethene. So later on, we'll be looking at developing a computational mechanism for CO2 reduction on copper 100. And the observation of these byproducts is something that a, can, a good candidate mechanism needs to account for. So, um, okay, so that's that. Um, that's now a bit of context. Now let me tell you a bit about how we will do these calculations. And I should say that, of course, it might sound a little bit fancy how we do them. But what I want to tell you is that probably in 10 or certainly in 20 years, people will look back and say what they did in 2022 was really, really crude. So this, in fact, is not a very um, sophisticated level of modeling in the sense that, for instance, Anne McCoy's group, when they model the spectroscopy of a molecule in the gas phase, they are very certain that they have everything essentially right. We are not so certain that we have everything right here. And so, in fact, validation or feedback with experiment is absolutely vital. This is not really truly predictive um, computational modeling today, which is actually why this area is so interesting. There's a lot of headroom, a lot of good future possibilities here. This is not something where I'm telling you about the end of the story. I'm telling you more about the beginning of the story. So, um, well, 
here's stuff that the theorists at any rate know about. If we solve the Schrodinger equation and we exist in a relative in a non-relativistic universe, or we put in the appropriate relativistic corrections, we will get the right answer, but at exponential compute cost in the number of electrons. So adding one more electron is a catastrophe, let alone adding a hundred more. Um, so approximations are vital. And these days, the most effective approximations, not to be confused with the most accurate ones, are density functional theory approximations, where the wave function unknown, which is so complicated because it depends simultaneously on the coordinates of all the electrons, is replaced by the electron density that depends on the coordinates of only one electron. However, instead of having an exactly known expression for the energy in terms of the wave function, that is a simple expectation value, there is a fantastically complicated functional form for the energy. And so the exact density functional is unknowable, and we wouldn't want to use it even if we could know it, because it would be like solving the Schrodinger equation. The key thing is that modeling the unknown exact functional, and that equation in the middle of the screen there um, shows you the Kohn-Sham DFT energies in terms of four components, three of which can be evaluated exactly, and one of which, the exchange correlation energy, must be modeled. Um, the models that we will use today are called generalized gradient approximations, and in another part of my life, I work on density functionals and GGAs are close to a solved problem. There won't be any substantially better GGAs in the future. We've already got the best ones available now, but they're not chemically accurate. So that means in terms of modeling catalysis, we're using these because we have to. We can't afford to use better functionals, let alone wave function theory methods. So we'll be using the RPBE functional and um, and of course, I am following a long tradition of many other groups. I might mention Jens Norskov's group, Bill Goddard's group, uh, the Cooper group, many other groups doing heterogeneous catalysis modeling using simple density functions. And as I've stressed, there'll be a bunch of errors. So using a simple GGA is a problem we are looking really at the solid liquid interface. So in other words, we've got copper as the cathode in contact with water and electrolyte, maybe between 0.1 and 1 molar electrolyte and protons, and things diffusing in and things diffusing out. Protons will be diffusing to, towards the cathode, products will be diffusing away. Well, to be more accurate, hydroxide ions will be diffusing away products like um, like the hydrocarbon will diffuse away. We will have issues with the solvation and the electrolyte modeling that represent an area where further improvements needed. And not only are the molecules out of equilibrium, the electrons are out of equilibrium. This system is being driven by applied voltage. So this is not like a molecule where the number of electrons is definitely known. When we do our modeling, we need to make sure that the electrons are energized corresponding to the applied voltage of about one volt. So we'll need to take care of the solvation and the electrolyte, the modeling of the applied bias. And this is one of the things we did contribute to the methodology. This is mostly an applications talk, but it has not been routine to do applied bias in density functional theory calculations. So I, I owe you a slide or two to tell you what we do. So because we're charging the electrode, we then use a continuum solvation model, continuum solvent and electrolyte, that is then the so-called linearized Poisson-Boltzmann model that provides the counter charge. In other words, the electrolyte will provide positive ion, positive ionic density coming towards the negatively charged cathode. And we adjust the number of electrons in the calculation to match the applied bias. And that will then add an extra loop to the normal self-consistent field iterations of Kohn-Sham theory. And there's yet one more inner loop that is making the continuum solvation self-consistent. So this is really a triple loop in the end compared to the normal single loop. And then if you do a geometry optimization, it's a quadruple loop, um, but it can be done. And, we, and that's what we do. 
and we use the VASP SOL package, and the electronic structure is done within the VASP code, which is a very good plain wave code. Um, okay, so that's uh, a little bit about the theory. Well, since I've told you how embarrassingly bad the, the simple the theory is, I owe you a little bit of validation data. So this is validation data, and um, and this is the potential of zero charge. How much bias do you have to apply to basically have a net charge zero at the solid liquid interface? And you can see that the agreement produced by this RPBE with continuum solvent and applied bias with experiment for potentials of zero charge on the electron volt scale is actually quite encouraging. And, um, and so this is a good basis for presuming that we can then begin trying to look at electrode catalysis with this tool. So um, I'll now try and tell you about the pathways to reducing CO um, and making the first CC bond. And, um, and the reason for beginning here is that the two electron reduction from CO2 to CO is mechanistically well understood. I don't think we need to go back over it. So, um, so let's begin. And, and now with this tool, instead of the usual quantum chemistry picture of some thermodynamics and some kinetics at fixed electron number, we will be able to scan the applied bias and we will get bias dependent thermodynamics and bias dependent kinetics. And if we're thinking about CO2 as the product as being two electron reduced to CO, um, at the cathode, alkaline conditions will generally prevail, meaning that even if the solution is overall acidic, near the cathode, we'll be using water molecules as the proton source and be producing hydroxide ions, which is why we'll have local alkaline conditions. So, um, here, are, um, here is the kind of data that we can calculate. So on the x-axis is, um, is the applied bias, and on the y-axis is the free energy change, and the two lower curves correspond to the thermodynamics for making the first reduction to either the star COH intermediate, so protonate on the oxygen, or the star CHO intermediate, i.e. protonate on the carbon, and in either case produce hydroxide. And the two upper curves are, are then show you the bias dependent barriers. So what you see is that as you charge the electrode negative, drive the voltage negative, the thermodynamics become favorable to produce these intermediates. Star CHO from CO becomes thermodynamically spontaneous. Um, in other words, we're, we're making that descending staircase for that first step. On the other hand, the kinetics are still quite difficult. And the more favorable intermediate star CHO has the less favorable kinetics. And in fact, a, a, a barrier of one volt means very difficult kinetics. Furthermore, the barrier significantly lower to the star COH means that one should form that preferentially. The difficult kinetics and the fact that the subsequent steps are a cascade downhill in free energy means these species will be rare. Um, so if you want to think about what does the cathode look like, you should imagine it as being mostly covered with CO and then a, a trace of these active intermediates and maybe some of the products if they, if they are bound and they don't desorb. The kinetics favor star COH in acid conditions as well. And, um, and we couldn't find um, a good COH to CHO interconversion pathway that doesn't just involve going back to CO and starting again. Maybe it's actually surface bound hydrogen that's responsible for making star, CO, star CHO by a, by a more viable pathway. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the protonating, protonation of CO. And it's an illustration of what we can calculate. Now let's talk about making the first CC bond. So in other words, we've made either CO or COH or, CA or CHO, or maybe even surface bound carbon. Um, and then thinking about the form of the cathode where CO is by far the dominant molecule, we should only look at pathways that involve CO itself. 
And, um, uh, and this is then a summary of the bias dependent thermodynamics for a bunch of pathways. Down the bottom, the blue pathway is the recombination of a surface carbon, surface carbide, if you like, with CO. That's the most favorable. If you are able to reduce CO all the way to surface bound carbon, that's the most favorable pathway to make a CC bond from the thermodynamic point of view. Uh, on the other hand, the least favorable up the top in dark blue is the recombination of two CO molecules um, which, um, uh, which, which gradually becomes less unfavorable as you apply bias towards the negative. And in between is the uh, CHO and COH pathways recombining with CO. But as we've seen before, kinetics often dictates what happens, not thermodynamics. So let's now take a look at the kinetics bearing in mind that from a thermodynamic point of view, most favored is surface bound carbon recombining with CO, least fav favored is CO dimerization. So there's the thermodynamic sequence that I just showed you. Now, what about the bias dependent kinetics? So as a function of voltage, here's the change in activation, free energy of activation for the forward pathways. And, um, and surface bound carbon actually becomes less favorable, less feasible as we go more negative in voltage, whereas, uh, whereas the CO recombination becomes more favorable. Um, so it looks as though, in fact, um, thermodynamics is not what dictates the outcome here. Kinetics suggests it'll be CO dimerization. And if we can make it, if it's there, and again, this is not a full so-called microkinetic model, this is just looking at elementary steps. If C8 star CHO is there, it will also compete, especially at relatively low biases. Okay, so, um, so in fact, we can really make some predictions here. And some of these predictions are quite, especially the role of CO recombination, seem to be consistent with the most recent experimental results. Well, you can then go further and um, our attempt to put together a full reaction mechanism will just give you a, a hint of the complexity here. And this was a, a tour de force by Alejandro Garza, who is a joint postdoc between Alex Bell, my collaborator, and, uh, and, and me. This is um, a summary of a mountain of work. Um, to kind of guide yourself through it, we begin up the top left with the humble CO molecule. And then we begin making the first reduction that we discussed and debated, and then the first CC bond that we discussed and debated. And that gets you through to step number three. And then down the bottom, um, right in the middle, in green is ethanol. And on the bottom to the right, just to the right of ethanol is ethene. And um, broadly speaking, the mechanism that Alejandro produced has two branches an ethanol pathway and an ethylene pathway. And I'll spend a bit of time telling you about uh, why these two branches are plausible. It has all to do with the observed byproducts. C glyoxyl um, in, in the middle in green, number 4B. Glyoxyl is there. Um, if you feed glyoxyl experimentally, you get no ethene. So glyoxyl must lie on the pathway to ethanol. Conversely, if you and, and and similarly, if you feed um, if you feed acetaldehyde, you get you get no ethene either. So there is this branch, and the mechanism needs to take account of it. And so this is the first mechanism that met all of these constraints. Um, all right, so let's let's uh, dig into first the branching. So again, the bias dependent kinetics can be done. We could either take surface bound um, OCHCO and protonate a terminal oxygen or protonate the other carbon. Protonating the other carbon gives us glyoxyl. Protonating a terminal oxygen gives us uh, the unnamed intermediate 4A. And, um, and the important thing is that glyoxyl is the gateway to forming ethanol and 4A is the gateway to forming ethene. And um, this is consistent with experimental data. Now the, um, 
delta G daggers here um, at U at minus one volt are about um, about one tenth of a volt in favor of um, of going down the ethene pathway, and that is consistent with an experimental ratio of five to one ethene production to ethanol production on copper one zero zero. So this is an example of something where you know we could predict it, but we wouldn't really believe it without the validation from experiment. In other words, our barriers are not good in general to a tenth of a volt. But if you get a happy cancellation of errors, you may be consistent with experimental data. If we'd had it five to one the other way, I'd be telling you that, well, it's just a DFT error. Um, and uh, low amounts of glyoxyl detected experimentally are consistent with this free energy cascade being downhill afterwards, which is what we find. So we don't really need to think about any barriers once we've got to glyoxyl. Everything else is a is falling down a staircase and landing at the bottom of the inverted thermodynamic well. Um, okay, so the ethanol pathway, um, I won't go through this in great detail, but it's consistent with the minor observed species. So glycoaldehyde, um, uh, is reduced to ethanol at high potential and reduced to acetaldehyde at low bias. And that's consistent with the way in which they appear in our mechanism. Acetaldehyde, on the other hand, can only be reduced to ethanol. And glycoaldehyde um, itself is, um, uh, if you feed that, uh, you in fact don't make a whole lot of ethanol. And, um, and that's simply because it fails to bind to the surface. I won't discuss that in detail. The ethene pathway is quite interesting because it consists of alternating highly um, uh, endergonic steps um, in, um, interspersed with exergonic steps. And so it's a slight, it's, a, it's an interesting looking staircase. Um, and um, this differs considerably from other proposals. As we'll see in a few minutes, one of the fun things about working on mechanism in heterogeneous catalysis is um, you will be challenged. And uh, if you're in the right frame of mind, those challenges can be fun. Um, so, um, so we claim that our mechanism meets all experimental criteria. And, um, um, uh, and well, amongst those is the fact that uh, we can understand what goes on with acetic acid. Um, uh, um, we make an experimental prediction there. If you feed ethylene oxide, you get ethene. So all these pieces kind of hang together. And um, OK, so, um, so let's, um, let's now turn to what happened after we published this, which was um, interesting um, because we were challenged by um, um, two separate challenges that I'll tell you each about briefly, simply because it's part of trying to shake out the information about how um, CO is reduced here. The first challenge was around our assumption that copper is the working catalyst. It sounds sort of silly, but it's not really silly because of course the copper is in solution and it may be transiently oxidized. So um, a surface oxide or a suboxide could in fact be the active catalyst. And there is some experimental information that suggests that oxide derived copper has a higher activity than pristine copper. So in other words, take copper oxide and reduce it. Um, and, um, and using ambient pressure XPS and density functional calculations, um, it was argued that a thin suboxide structure binds CO2 and promotes the first conversion step. And, um, and so those are, those, are, those are things that suggest maybe the assumption of copper is, uh, is, is uh, not ideal, but, um, um, but the thermodynamic and kinetic stability of the surface of the suboxide, um, subsurface oxide has to be considered and it has to be considered under operating conditions. Um, the experiments that were looked at to address the, um, uh, the question of the suboxide, they were not in situ, they were not operando experiments, rather the catalyst was removed and placed in the XPS instrument. And in fact, what we find is that um, the lifetime of a suboxide in in situ conditions with applied bias is minutes on copper 111, and we predict microseconds on copper 100. 
So, um, so this in fact favors the, idea, the Occam's razor suggestion that the simplest catalyst is indeed the one we should think about that the active catalyst probably can be copper. Um, Suboxides will, will not, are not thermodynamically stable. Um, so, um, um, so there's also some recent experimental work that suggests subsurface oxides are not either thermodynamically or kinetically favorable. And um, I guess I will skip this, but, um, but yeah, so um, oxide derived copper electrodes are interesting but, um, because essentially you get a higher number of, um, um, of uh, low coordination sites and, and a higher surface area. And that can give improved activity without the necessity to have an oxide involved. Okay, there was a second challenge. Um, this is a quite interesting one. And we, as you might notice, we got a JFIS chem let paper out of responding to the first challenge. We got a JAX paper out of responding to the second one. So this was altogether a quite productive uh, interaction. Um, so um, uh, a very good experimentalist actually at my institution, LBL, um, showed that when C16O reduction was performed in water that was uh, used oxygen 18, something like two thirds of the ethanol produced contained oxygen 18, which must then come from the solvent. And um, they then rounded up a theorist. They went to Caltech where all the best theorists reside. And, um, uh, and uh, they reported as follows. We found a new mechanism involving a grotus chain of six water molecules in a concerted reaction with the star CCH intermediate, which I didn't mention before, um, to form star CHCH 18OH, subsequently leading to oxygen 18 containing ethanol. And in particular, and amusingly, therefore all previous mechanisms for the formation of oxygenates require re-examination, in particular, the one I told you about. Um, so, um, all right, so on the other hand, again, this, Grotus chain of six water molecules. This is a bit exotic in a bulk solution of water. And uh, also the calculated barrier was a bit on the high side. So, um, so we wondered if there might be a simpler explanation in addition to simply wanting to defend the mechanism. So what about isotopic scrambling? Um, so, um, um, so in fact, um, um, isotopic scrambling is a good possibility in an intermediate. The experimental study, of course, checked for isotopic scrambling of ethanol and showed that didn't occur. But that just because it doesn't occur in the product doesn't mean that it couldn't have occurred in an intermediate on the way to the product. All right, so we then dug through our list of intermediates to try and think about, and we began thinking about the hydration of acetaldehyde to make a diol and then the dehydration to lose water. Be a very easy way to get the oxygen 18 into the acetaldehyde intermediate. And remember the other experiment, if you feed acetaldehyde, you make ethanol. So a little data, um, the, um, the activation energy on the left axis in black, the thermodynamics in red, um, little cluster calculations showing you that equilibrium constant is well, on the order of one. Um, and um, then one more thing, remember the local pH. We are busy consuming protons that come out of water making hydroxides. So we've got alkaline conditions. So we, we won't actually necessarily have to even use water. We could use hydroxide and we could then make the conjugate base of the diol. And that is um, not only a quite facile reaction, but the, the, di the diolate is a very, very strong base. It'll be readily protonated by water and uh, yet, and then the reverse reaction will then take you back to acetaldehyde with oxygen 18. So anyway, so we, we think that was probably what was going on. Then one last story, um, and I'll then wrap up and try and leave time for questions is some, um, the role of how you um, process copper is, um, is, under, um, is under active study at the moment. And we began looking at the role of surface roughness. And um, this is the first computational work to 
carefully study the effect of surface morphology on, um, on uh, CO2 reduction reaction activity. And so what we did computationally was to make copper oxide, nitride, phosphide, sulfide, and deoxygenate, denitrogenate, dephosphorize, and desulfize um, these materials to leave behind oxide derived, nitride derived, phosphide derived, and sulfide derived copper. And, um, and you then get a, uh, in comparison to the reference surfaces, you then build a, an interesting distribution of sites um, that include not just the uh, atop site, but a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of sites um, that, um, that then lead you to um, a, a diversity of binding energies for copper, um, which, uh, and the lower the binding energy for copper, very likely the higher the reactivity in terms of processing um, substrates coming from solution. So oxide derived copper electrodes enhance C2 and higher yields. Um, the mechanism is not fully known. And this is data that we produced showing you that, um, uh, that enhancing the representation of over coordinated fourfold hollow sites leads to improved selectivity of C2 plus products. So um, there's some possible design principles for better catalysts here and, um, and much more still to be done. So that's a hint of what can be done that way. Uh, in, my, in, my, in my title, I told you I would tell you something about corrosion and I've been very, uh, uh, very delinquent about doing that. That's because we're actually in the middle of trying to model it now, and our results are not quite ready for prime time. But um, corrosion um, is something that everyone talks about, but at a molecular level, it's not very well understood at all. For instance, specifically, as you take, say, a silver 111 surface and attack it by applied bias that makes forming a silver iron relatively favorable. So this would now be a positively charged surface, not a negatively charged one. Um, how, how does the solvent network, the hydrogen bonding network get formed or disrupted? So this seems to us to be another very suitable application for DFT with applied bias. And it's also very relevant for the durability question of catalysts. How long will they last? How are they degraded? So um, here's just a, a little bit of data to show you that this can be done. So um, um, we're plotting here as a function of distance. So this is pulling a silver atom out of a silver 111 surface. This is the net charge on the silver atoms. And what you see is that that charge shifts by one electron as you go from zero, um, zero angstroms of pulling to 10 angstroms of pulling. That might look like a rather trivial result because of course it's what you're hoping for, but density functional theory is famous for what is called the delocalization error. So it was not completely obvious that we would get this. We might've got half an electron um, oxidized away. Um, then what about the, um, what about the, pulling profile. This is the profile for pulling a silver atom out from a silver 111 surface. This looks really quite encouraging to me. We see that there is a barrier associated with pulling um, a silver atom out at all applied biases, but that that barrier falls by roughly a factor of two as we go from zero volt to plus one volt as we charge the surface positive. And most importantly, the thermodynamics goes from um, endogonic um, at the low applied biases to exogonic at the, higher, at the highest applied bias of plus one volt. So this basically says that corrosion becomes thermodynamically spontaneous, kinetically um, inhibited. And, um, and then the kind of data that we're just beginning to acquire is here, showing you how the water layer um, is changed as you begin to pull out a silver atom and turn it into a silver iron. And as you turn it into a silver iron, it will become solvated and will develop a characteristic local solvent structure that's well understood when the iron gets well away from the electrode. But this transition is what's especially interesting. So um, I will wrap up now. Um, 
what can theory tell us and what can't it tell us? Um, I hope that I've given you evidence that even for as messy a system as CO2 reduction reaction on copper, you can get very interesting results with small change, relatively small changes to a standard code. We wrote Python scripts to execute this um, Fermi level shifting to apply the voltage. And the results are then potential dependent free energy changes and reaction barriers. If you carry it further and you're very confident about it, we're not confident enough about either the accuracy of our numbers or the fact that we have all the pathways. We can't really make a microkinetic model out of this. Instead, we've produced an overall sketch of a mechanism and you get properties and information about the abundance of the surface intermediates. And then I told you this was simple modeling. So we've got errors in the density functionals. There must be really interesting stuff associated with the fluctuations, molecular level fluctuations of solvent um, that we um, average out in the continuum treatment. And then most scary is the possibility of misidentified intermediates or missing intermediates. After all, a mechanism cannot be proved right. It can only be proved wrong. That's been kind of part of the scientific fun of this, which is we've withstood a couple of challenges. There are surely things wrong with our mechanism, but not the ones that have been identified so far. Um, and, uh, and so perhaps in conclusion, we've made some progress, but there is still a great deal of work needed to um, advance both the methodology and the applications of understanding chemical bond making under these highly non-equilibrium conditions. The electron distribution is non-equilibrium, the, the molecular distribution is non-equilibrium. And thank you to my co-workers. So this was all a collaboration with Professor Alex Bell, a, a professor of chemical engineering at Berkeley, who over about a decade and a half has taught me everything I know about heterogeneous catalysis. Of course, I've still got a ways to go. And then the co-workers are joint between our groups, Alejandro Garza, who's now uh, a scientist at Dow, Joe Gauthier, who's an assistant professor at Texas Tech, Jason Goodpaster, who's at the University of Minnesota, Joe Lynn, who in fact was a graduate student with Anne, who's at the University of Massachusetts, Jonathan Wong, and the new work on corrosion, uh, Richard Kang and Diptaka Haight. Um, I'm a small wheel in a giant machine, a um, small cog in a giant machine that is called the Liquid Sunlight Alliance, which gives us the money to work on this. And before that, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis made it possible. And then some of the work was supported by the Department of Energy's SIDAC Scientific Partnership. I'm grateful to all of them for funding, grateful to you for listening, and just happy to be here. Thank you.